what they say is the shadow of what was, whereas what is actually happening now is a really rapid change. And so we're having to assimilate this. You know, the guide said in the very first book they dictated through me, which was in 2009, um, they said, humanity is at a time of reckoning, and a reckoning is a facing of oneself and all of one's creations. And everything that's been created in fear is going to have to be renown or reclaimed in a higher way. Mm. I don't think a lot of that stuff happens until we are in an encounter with it. You yeah. know, we're responsible for what we create, which includes, you know, how we treat each other and ourselves and the planet. Right now on Higher Journeys with Alexis Brooks. Paul Selig, welcome finally to Higher Journeys, my dear. So delighted. I'm going to speak to the audience and say, uh, journeyers, we've been uh, chatting for a few minutes and I just decided to press record and, and say, let let this conversation flow and go where it needs to go. So you're, you've heard a little bit. I, I'm going to cut this in and post so you can hear some of what Paul had to say in the uh beginning of this conversation. What they say is the shadow of what was, whereas what is actually happening now is a really rapid change. And so we're having to assimilate this. You know, the guide said in the very first book they dictated through me, which was in 2009, um, they said humanity is at a time of reckoning and a reckoning is a facing of oneself and all of one's creations. And everything that's been created in fear is going to have to be renown or reclaimed in a higher way. Mm. I don't think a lot of that stuff happens until we are in an encounter with it. You yeah. know, we're responsible for what we create, which includes, you know, how we treat each other and ourselves and the planet. I have never heard something as as succinct. I'm nodding voraciously, Paul, because that that's the real deal. I think that I think many of us particularly in this work, know at our core, this is what's going on. The tumult is something that we must face before we can get on the other side of this. And the, you said, we might, I just pressed record. We could just keep this conversation going. We do a conversation here. It's pretty relaxed. I right. just want to pull something. Um, we're going to talk about your new book. Congratulations, yeah. coming, getting ready to come out. Yeah. Um, and I grabbed it. I did, haven't had a chance to read it. Sarah sent mm -hmm. me the, uh, the PDF. But I found this that I thought was so powerful in the intro where you say, or what they said, what comes prior to what you were about to read is a comprehension of who you have been, how you have chosen, what you have known yourselves through, and how you have actually been complicit, big one, in the world that you see and all of its manifestations. And I, I can go on, but you know, mm -hmm. complicit. And that's yeah. the other thing we have to face. We have to face the freaking fact that we created the world that we're experiencing. And universe is like, it's time to move on. And, yeah. uh, you know, you're going to have to face the music to an extent before we can do that, right? Hmm. Well, that's exactly what I hear. You know, when they talk about complicit, it's not necessarily as a negative. But what they say is, you know, we're in coherence, energetic coherence and accord with manifestation, with everything that we see and, and experience. You know, so we're in alignment to this world and we're contributing to this world by how we hold things in consciousness. Mm -hmm. And the guides say very simply, and it's a simple teaching, what you damn damns you back. What you put in darkness, who you put in darkness calls you to the darkness. And there's a whole lot that we put in darkness in which they say what that really is, is just the denial of what they call the inherent divine. They say the only real problem humanity has is what they call the 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 refuting or the denial of source. And that's not a religious teaching. That means God is the sky, God is the tree, the source of all things that's expressing in manifestation. So I think people get off on this thing that manifestation is about getting something. You know, mm -hmm. I'm supposed to manifest this, manifest that. And most of what I understand we're asking for is what we think we're supposed to have. Mm -hmm. And that's born in a common field of that was sort of moored in, in a sense of separation to begin with. If you, if you know the source of all things, you can come become receptive to it. And it's not as much about demanding, it's about becoming receptive to what is already present. We've been talking about the hard knocks that many of us are experiencing right now and the why of it all. And Paul, as he has been so eloquent and consistent over the years and bringing through both his own wisdom, by the way, as well as the guides well known to so many. Um, 
we need them now more than ever, Paul. We need you now more than ever. So that being said, I'm going to I'm going to make an assumption, journeyers. I call my audience the journeyers that uh, many of our audience, many of you uh, probably know who Paul Selig is. So uh, we're not going to go into the beginnings of his. I, I had started to do that, Paul, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make it a I'm going to make a, 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 a judgment call and say most people know who you are. So we're going to get right into the core of what we've been talking about. Let me stop talking and let P Paul talk. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome, sir. Happy to Thank have you. Thank you for having me. It's it's an honor and a pleasure. Let's continue down this road. We are, um, I've been saying to my audience for a couple of years, a few years now, we're uh, at a, living at a metaphysically potent time. Mm -hmm. Um, but with that, it's not good or bad. It just is. And it's it's yeah. heavy energy. I'm going to have you piggyback on that. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I, I like that you said it's just what is. And I think our decision to sort of call things good or awful is is part of the way that we claim reality. You know, and as I said, you know, we're in coherence with everything that we see. So my guides say, you know, the divine sees the divine in all of its creations. You know, God sees God in everything. And they also go so far as to say is, you know, it also talks back to you. And the guides have often said, you know, you can't make anything holy. It already is. But the denial of the divine is really the challenge because we've been taught to deny the divine. But in terms of what's going on now, I understand it as an acceleration of vibration. And it's uncomfortable. You know, the guides recently said... Um, it's like being on a boat and you're going to a strange sea and the, all the passengers are, you know, there's mutiny going on. Nobody trusts the captain. You know, this, the boat's rocking around. But this is sort of the passage towards what they call a new shore, a new way of being in the world. And they actually say that it takes some time, several generations for this to really occur. But we're in it now and it's going to continue. So I don't expect it to get much more comfortable. And I also understand that comfortability is, um, you know, our attachment to a status quo that I don't think that we're going to be able to maintain anymore. I think things have changed. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have been seeing some semblance of the same, Paul, um, mm -hmm. holding on to the status quo. I think many in this community know that that's true. And yet, well, even even the most well-intentioned of us are tethered, you know, yeah. uh, we're, we're habitual creatures at our core. Yeah. So we're trying our, our best mm -hmm. question for you. How, I know the guides have been sort of going down this road in preparation for all of this that's happening now for a while, but how long have they really been speaking in this tone of expecting this, this shift that's going on right now? Well, I mean, I've, I've been working with them since I was in my early thirties, or at least an aspect of them. I didn't begin to lecture or they didn't begin to lecture through me until I was about 48 years old. And that's when the dictation really started in fullness. Primarily their work was energetic and they would come through with attunements and they would come through with energy that was extremely palpable and important things to know but as teachers, they became available to me really, you know, once I quit smoking, you know, then I, that was my barrier. I was, I loved a good cigarette and I would channel and smoke out the window if I could. But they said, we want to continue working with you and we, we can't unless you attend to this. So I stopped my four packs a day and let, oh them, let them do what they do. And they've been nonstop ever since. So this is a relationship, at least in this lifetime, that you know, I had an experience when I was a child that I still think was the guides, you know, sort of telling me that they were there and would be there. And they've said to me that I've been doing this work with them prior to this lifetime, that mm -hmm. this is an older relationship. And I think that that's perhaps true. But they're teachers and they say they've been teaching what they're teaching now for a very long time. And that in every generation, they come in one way or another. And I suspect what's different with how they're working now and how they work through me is the work comes through with an energetic component that's palpable. You know, people can feel it when the guides are doing their attunements, people that have never had an experience of clairsentience or energy before begin to have it and in profound ways. And it's really quite remarkable. That's why I was so interested in the work because it was so experiential. You know, I have to say, I'm not a spiritual teacher. I'm not a guru. I don't want to be. I'm this guy that takes dictation. That's really my job. 
when I work psychically, which is a little different, I'm I'm working as a radio and I'm tuning into the client. And when the guides are working through me, they're the station that I'm in broadcast with. But they say that they've been doing this since before we know. You know, they 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 exist beyond time. You know, we know ourselves in time, and they'll they'll utilize the calendar and the clock to show up with me. I mean, they know when it's time to work and they, they've they never failed, thank God, because otherwise I couldn't show up. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, but this is- More, more than answered thing. it. And you, yeah. you've actually answered a question that I haven't asked yet. So that works out perfectly. I know okay. that you've referred to yourself as merely, not merely, but a, a radio, lit- literally a transmitter. Yeah. 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 And- um, that and I, I just want to talk a little bit about the process again. I'm assuming that many of you watching have seen Paul uh, channel the guides, and you've got such and a unique just process. Froze. Oh, did, you, am you I just back? froze. Yeah, you just froze, so I didn't okay. hear what you just said. Okay, that's okay. You guys, it's Mercury retrograde, so we're just going to let it all flow. <laughs> I just froze, Paul said. Okay, so I will repeat. I don't know how much you heard, but I was speaking to the fact that you refer to yourself as a radio. And mm-hmm. then I had gone into a little bit about just commenting on the process that you uh, get the information, take that dictation, mm-hmm. where I've never heard this done quite like you do it before, where mm-hmm. it's almost like a whisper that comes through and then you re-enunciate so we can all hear it. Was mm-hmm. it always that way, Paul? Yeah. I mean, you know, recently it's not been that way at times and they're speaking very directly through me. I mean, it's happened before over the years. I'm, I have a very hard time sustaining it. The energy is just almost too enormous Mm -hmm. for that for me. And I also don't remember anything that I just said, which is hard right now. I'm able to interrogate the teaching if I need to. So I describe how I work. It's like reading fortune cookies, one after the other, after the other. And I just hear phrases. I don't know the whole sentence. I don't know the whole paragraph. I don't even know the title of the book until they say, this is the title of the book or the chapter or whatever. And it's not until I can tell when it's flowing, but not until I see the transcript or I see the book. And the books are the unedited, you know, transcripts of of these channelings. We don't go back and fix things that I understand the logic and the coherence of, of the whole thing. Um, and what was the question again? So the process at the very, very beginning, you know, I, I didn't believe in channeling. First of all, I wasn't somebody, I wasn't an advocate. I wasn't a very good new ager, but I had this experience and this beginning of a spiritual awakening when I was about 25. And then I started seeing little lights around people. And then I studied a form of healing to get a context for this. Cause I didn't, I didn't know what else to do. And this was back in the day. And now everybody and their brother is doing Reiki. And in those days, it was very strange and very out there. And I was studying with this old woman who um, was doing her own thing, but had been one of the first 13 Reiki masters in the U.S. And, you know, and that's what I learned. But I found when I had my hands on people, I would hear for them. And all of my clairaudience has always been in service for others. It's Mm -hmm. not really about getting information for me. Um, and when I started to do a group in my apartment and the channeling began, I used to really feel like somebody had their lips pressed against my forehead and oh. they were impressing the words and my lips would form the words. And that became the whisper. That was the whisper. And then I think I got used to it. And I, it may be a, a bad habit, but it's effective, I have to say. And um it allows me this much, this much of a sense of, of being present. And I suppose that gives me an, an illusion of a kind of control. Mm-hmm. But I did a lecture. They did. It was on a live stream. And it was, you know, a long lecture. I haven't listened to it yet. It was without any repetition at all. But I don't remember it. And, um, and it feels oddly out of control. And I don't know. And I suspect... It's that the level of vibration that they're coming with is being worked with. They're giving it to me at the level that I can fully hold it. They, mm-hmm. they're, they're enormous. And it's a huge, huge energy. The books are energetic transmissions. So this is how it is and how it's been. And I know 
it's not very pretty to watch and very graceful, you know, and I wish some days that I was one of those people that could just sit there in the lotus position and announce, you know, the, 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 beautifully and look great doing it, by the way, <laughs> what I'm getting. And, you know, I, I did not want to record myself for years. I mean, I really, I still don't like to watch it because it's challenging. And I know that it's challenging for people that are watching me work. And truthfully, I don't watch other channels. I, mm -hmm. I don't. I've seen snippets of people occasionally when I'm scrolling through social media that that happens. And um, I saw some footage of Jane Roberts who channeled Seth yes. in the 70s. And I recognized it completely. I saw how she was working. And I saw how the body was working. And, you know, when I work, my body's affected. My eyes which are dark hazel, I mean, they're not light. Often, they often run bright, bright blue, pale blue. People think I have blue eyes. And I, that's only when I'm really working, that they're really, when they're really present through me. And when I am channeling, when I'm reading for other people, like if I were to tune into you or your brother, I'm, and often people I'm not seeing at all, I will often take on their demeanor you know, their physical characteristics when I step in. So it's it's part of the way that I seem to work or be worked with. Mm -hmm. You said a lot, but the thing that sticks the most, and I think that the reason why so many um, respect you in this work that you do is your humility and your, it's not necessary to be a pretty picture here. And you really, in the way you deliver it, to me, is corroborating the authenticity of what is happening here. You talk about Jane Roberts. I happen to be a student of Seth. I've been uh, reading the work, uh, yeah. studying it voraciously for many years now. I have a whole entire catalog, including the early sessions. And and I, I recall looking at Jane Roberts in those early days and just thinking, wow, that looks painful. Yeah. The the contortions and the, you know, the rocking and and I've seen yeah. many channels uh, uh, do their work, and I suppose everyone has their own process, but yeah. the way yours is done is so unique. And thank you for being so eloquent and explaining what you're having to sacrifice, essentially, in order to bring this through. How, I have to ask you, how do you take care of yourself in the midst of all this? Because there has to be some wear and tear. There's a lot of wear and tear. Um, and, and I work, you know, the guides just finished their, their 12th book about three days ago, and it was a five-week process, maybe about five weeks of dictation. And, you know, sometimes they were doing, and it was most, it was actually entirely done in front of students. So sometimes they're channeling, I'm sitting before people for five hours in a day, and they're doing lecture after lecture. But, you know, I used to eat, and I ate far, far, far too much, and now I don't get to do that the way I like to, because um, I do like to eat. And, you know, I'll you know, I live on, I live on Maui. I can be in the sun. I can be in the water. I can get, I have healer friends that will work on me. So I'm, I feel well taken care of in this work I'm, and well provided for actually, which is surprising to me because who would have thought, I mean, I was a college teacher, you know, mm -hmm. for 25 years. At That's NYU, I, right? I taught at NYU for 25 years. I ran a graduate program at a, an old hippie school in Vermont called Goddard for 18 years. Yes, I know. Yeah, and I loved it. I was good at it. It was a way of being in the world. And it really, in some ways, supported me in what I do now. Although I was doing this work concurrent with that, I was just under the radar, you know, and I wanted to stay that way. I had a, a website without my name or my photograph. I didn't want people, you had to know me to get an appointment. And the little group that met in my apartment was by invitation. And that went on for 18 years. And that's really where I was developed and trained. People would put 10 bucks in a basket, 20 bucks, I think. And at the end, I really got steep, you know, and, um, and, you know, eventually what happened was the book started coming and um, my name is on the books. I'm not the author, but my name is on the books and mm -hmm. I have to accept that and begin to step into it a bit more. We are living at a time of great challenge and incredible opportunity. A time when taking life into our own hands, charting our own course, and finding our own answers is more accessible than ever before. During this time, you may be asking yourself, what am I called to do? What if I could discover not only my own inner healing power, but help others all over this planet discover theirs? We all have the ability to heal ourselves, but it takes a special approach, a unique approach. 
quantum healing hypnosis technique, also known as QHHT, a method developed by pioneering hypnotherapist and past life regression expert Dolores Cannon, is the approach that thousands have used and taught to access the deeper aspect of the self for healing at the core level. We all have the ability to tap into the higher self, the oversoul, the higher consciousness, and we have the means to help others to do the same. QHHT is designed to help the individual access the subconscious, the storehouse of all information through visualization at the deepest level imaginable, a process that Dolores Cannon discovered and refined during her decades of working with individuals from around the globe. Training with QHHT will provide the guidance and give you the tools to help others tap that incredible force within. Now, you can access this exclusive training online, bringing the tools needed right to you, so you can assist others in finding their own answers and achieve total healing. This is powerful and needed now more than ever. Be a part of the pioneering work and legacy of Dolores Cannon by learning QHHT. Start today by clicking on the link in the description of this show to get started. And when you do, don't forget to mention Higher Journeys to get a 10% course discount when you sign up. It's time we all take back control of our lives and chart the course for success at every level. It's time to discover the power of quantum healing hypnosis technique by helping others to help themselves. And by doing this, we are helping to heal the world. Right. Your name is on the book and I think it says a channel text underneath. So it's clear yeah. that you are, you are the, uh, the dictator, but more, yeah. much more. You made mention, Paul, of your suspicion that there that you had worked with this form of energy in a previous incarnation. One of my questions was, I, but I think you've answered it: is could this have indeed been a, an agreement that you were to yeah. come here to do this work, and maybe even be relocated to where you are now? You speak of the healing energies, despite all that's gone yeah. on recently and by the way paul is fine thank goodness mm -hmm. uh, over in maui but uh all of these are seems so intricately orchestrated they do and they do in retrospect and they didn't at the time and i have to say this you know when i look back you know i had been a writer when i was young and i had the worst case of writer's block of anybody i've ever met in my life and i was running a writing program you know and i was so ashamed all the time that i I wasn't fulfilling this potential that I thought I was supposed to live up to. And the irony now is, you know, I close my eyes, I sit in a chair and a book gets spoken into being and then mm -hmm. published unedited in weeks. You know, I think 24, 25 days, I think was the, the number of dictate, the number Amazing. of session, the number of days of, of dictation that we did. So I find the irony, but I also now know that nothing was wasted. You know, mm -hmm. none of it was wasted. And and it was hard. You know, I'm not one of these people who opened up like a flower. I opened up and I fell apart, you know, and then it was a process of coming back together and relearning. I um, I got sober at 25 after I started praying for the first time in my life. And then I heard a voice telling me to get my act together, which was the first voice. And I listened to it and I didn't and I stopped, you know, as a result of that. And, um, you know, I look at my life in those early years where I was opening up to spirituality in a, in a very significant way, but also completely confused by everything because the life that I thought I was supposed to live, I wasn't able to live anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't, I didn't know how things fit. People said, you know, it sounds like what happened to me in my, at 25, shortly after I, I stopped drinking was a, it was a Kundalini awakening of some kind, some big experience of energy. But I felt kind of dislocated in my own life and with my own idea of self. And that's what sort of has allowed this whole path to unfold, inclusive of the teaching and inclusive of everything. And God knows it was all useful. I do think when I look back, that there was a hunger for transcendence that was always present. I don't know that I could have named it God because I grew up in a household where that was scoffed at, you know, and we didn't believe in anything. You know, my father, he was a Holocaust survivor. I mean, he was, he made it into, into England in a kinder transport when he was maybe 10 or 12. And he died when I was very young. And my mother, poor thing, you know, was abused by her minister. And both of them, no, there was no God in this house at all. Mm 
Mm -hmm. It was for other people. And I suspect that there was a, a deep longing, a really deep longing that I had for source or God or something. And I do think it's an old source, but I think we all have it. Yeah. You know, I think we all have it. It's on there for all of us. I think that's the God within asking to be known through us, you know. Okay. Amazing. Amazing that you are being so transparent with us, Paul, and sharing all the bumps and bruises yeah. and the context for the pain that brought you to this point. And I can't help but think that you are really a beacon for all of the people. Lord knows we live on a planet of complete dysfunction in history mm -hmm. of abuse and trauma and mental illness and you name it, here it yeah. is. And it seems to be exponentially higher now. And yet, if we follow your trajectory, not exactly, I'm trying to figure out, there's a reason for all of this and all that you've gone through that brought you to this point that is bringing you to, to be a teacher for us to possibly f be okay with the bumps and bruises because there's something on the other side of it, if I'm making sense at all. You, you know, you are. I, <laughs> I, I don't think of myself as the teacher. I do think of myself as, as a collaborator on the text. And okay. I, understand, I understand my role here because I get to interpret what they say in interviews like this or when students come forward and they ask a question, I'll go, well, I know the answer to this and I'll answer. And then they'll say, well, that isn't quite right. And they'll come in sometimes with how they would like something to be understood. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for this, this, this position that I find myself in. Mm -hmm. But in those early, early days, and this is where I do think it's helpful, because I, I was having a rough time. I mean, I was, I was saying this to somebody the other day, you know, when I got clean and I had, you know, had just gotten an Ivy League degree that I couldn't use and certainly couldn't pay back the loans I took. That took till I was about 50. Mm. Um, but I was, I, it took me two years to be able to have enough money to get a bank account. I mean, I was that poor in those, in those years. And somebody very kind, I don't know who it was, said to me something that I never forgot. They said, you know, Paul, as dark as you've been, that's how much light you can hold. And that made an enormous difference. And let me say, let me, you know, say, well, maybe there's another side or there's something to it, or this is part of something. And I'm glad I stayed with it because, you know, I, 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 it's possible I could not have. But I do think in retrospect, yeah. But I think this is this sort of beats the lives where I was, you know, <laughs> burnt at the stake. So I'm not going to complain too much, you know. So yeah. why not show up as you can? Absolutely. Well, again, thank you for that. You know, before we get too, too much farther into this, I want to share with our audience a wonderful event uh, taking place at Gaia. I'm so de delighted to be working with Gaia and Paul. They're, I know they're going to treat you well. They're doing a live event, guys, on September 23rd with starring Paul Selig and Daryl Lanka and Sheila Gillette and, and, and others. And I want to go ahead and play a little, little clip for you so you can uh, learn a little bit about this. And on the back end, we'll continue this great conversation. So take a look at this. Spirit guides are around us. It doesn't matter what culture you come from. Each human being is not alone. You are always agreeing to your reality of conscious at whatever level you choose. That is how creation grows. That's how creation expands. Turn the lights off. It's your higher power, you might say. You can rediscover who you are in a new way, from a new perspective, with new understanding. Surrender to the truth and to the magic that is within you. Wow. Huge. You looking forward to this coming up soon? I am. I really am. That's great. So guys, uh, we'll obviously have a link down below where you can learn more about it. I believe that I know this is a live event. I think it's almost sold out at this point. No surprise. But uh, I'm told that you can also see it a uh, live stream and mm -hmm. after the fact. So we'll make sure to have all the details there. This is I've been really, really um of late, I have to say, uh, very interested in, in not just channeling, I have been for a while, but really looking into how it has progressed and become part of more of a quasi mainstream discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know it has its detractors, I, you know, yeah. it's somewhat controversial to some. How do you, 
I don't know, reconcile that or approach that, or if you do at all. Uh, you know, it's funny. I I don't give it much thought anymore. I've been public with this for long enough. I actually feel that for the most part, my great concerns around this and what people would think have not been an issue. People have been mostly kind around this. I didn't believe in channeling and I still see things on occasion online floating through where I go, well, I don't know that that's channeling, but I'm a real purist around this. You know, I think people, I, I make a distinction between inspiration and channeling. And I think the real thing with channeling is that you don't get to go back and fix it. You don't get to go back and make it pretty because it's not yours to correct. Mm. I'm not the author of the books. So occasionally, and, and I'm the book that, you know, is coming out. I don't know another book that's coming out next week, but the one that was just completed, I think I draw, I think I added an S to a word that didn't need to be pluralized. We can correct that. It's pretty clear, but <laughs> often I'm just speaking so fast. And in any book, maybe there are three words that I garbled or I was I, I mispronounced because I didn't know the word or I assumed it was a different word because, you know, effervescent, you hear efferva and you think effervescent, you right, know, you of course. Complete, as opposed to eff, effer something other, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I'm pretty good about maintaining it now. So I don't care at a certain level about this. Early on when, you know, there was first I was I, I cared very much when this first started, because I was trying to maintain a career as an academic, knowing that my freshmen were showing up at NYU having watched me on YouTube and were rolling their eyes. I'm going, mm -hmm. okay, how am I gonna do this now? But um, early on, somebody posted a video of me. I don't know who this was. And I don't even know what the video was. And they said, look at this guy. He's working too hard to be faking it. And I went, well, that feels right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> there you go. And I and honestly, if I was gonna fake it, I would look a lot better than I do. Mm. You know, it would be a little more elegant. So mm. I can't care. I think that the idea of taking dictation from me wasn't so foreign because I had been a playwright when I was a kid. And that was all about hearing voices and rendering voices. And I actually used to induce trance when I would write. I was also drunk in those days, but I would induce trance by putting one piece of music on loop for, you know, 10 hours and just sit there and do that. So in some ways I was already learning what it meant to step out of the way and be receptive. And the difference now is, and I didn't know this until it happened. Once I, I was sitting with some woman and she asked about her father and I tuned into her father and, I, and my eyes were closed and she gasped. I said, what's wrong? She said, oh my God, you started to look just like him. And I went, well, that's interesting. And then every time it would happen. And I realized that that's kind of what I was doing right. in my old days, just opening up to here. And that there was a whole other sort of component to it that I hadn't understood. This brings about so many other aspects to what is happening here. I, I'm immediately thinking of the idea of a holographic model of reality, the fact mm -hmm. that reality indeed could be so malleable that doing something as powerful as bringing through con another consciousness can literally shift the sure. biology of a corporeal being. Yeah. And I've heard this before, by the way, this is, um, this is, this could warrant a part two just on that aspect alone. Mm -hmm. The eye mm -hmm. color changing and the fact that yeah. this woman said that she started to see the yeah. form of your father literally externalized mm -hmm. in you. Have you have you ever seen that happen? Say looking in the mirror. Have you ever yeah. seen your face? I don't, I don't try. I was on a TV show a number of years ago. I was called The Unexplained. It was the first iteration of that, mm -hmm. where they were filming people doing their work with people who had no other, you know, it was helping people who had no other means of help. They were going to the metaphysical. And I was reading for this woman. She's a lovely woman. She was a mom from Connecticut. And all I was told was she was having problems. I mean, she, well, she said, I promised my kid and my husband. I tuned into the kid because the kids, kids are easier. They're not they're not protecting in the same way that adults mm -hmm. can. So it's really easy to tune in and get a read. 
And I somatized the kid, not knowing what was wrong, but you can see me, my hands curl up, I began to rock. It turned out the kid had cerebral palsy and I was mirroring him completely and they intercut. And I have to say, I all I knew was what I was doing. I didn't know what it meant. And at one point I lost my hearing in the reading. I said, is he deaf? And she said, I don't know. And I'm thinking, this is 13 year old, she doesn't know, you know, but she didn't. And it turned, and I kept just hearing the kid, he kept saying, you can't hear me. He kept saying, you can't hear me and get me out of my body. Get me out of here. Those are the two things. And I'm like, what does this mean? And it turned out the kid had never spoken a word in his life. Mm -hmm. And I watched that thing about 30 times. And I actually was kind of astonished because I didn't know what could happen because I forget a reading the moment it's done. It's fortunate. It's like a blackboard, you know, and of the channelings, I maybe retain a third of what was said. But the words are coming so, so fast that I'm just right. trying to keep up. So, I mean, that's that's it. I think it's really interesting. I would love to get, you know, wired up. Somebody, some neurologist did wire me up once. Okay. To see what was there. And they said something that didn't make any sense to me at all. They said, like, I had the, my, my normal mind was like, they said about, I don't know what there's a word for it state that you go into and i remember what it was but you said this is you have data like or uh, well alpha is something that we yeah some some no, brain some, wave something else yeah she said you have like the brain of like a, a monk that's been meditating for 80 years and that's not my experience of myself at all i'm still worried and neurotic and i do the much better than i used to and all she noticed really when she looked at the stuff was that when i was channeling my audio receptors would light up in a big, big way. Mm -hmm. But I'm really curious about how this all works. And I always have been, and I don't know how it works. I don't know that I can teach people to do it as a result, because I don't understand it. Other people can. Do you feel a need to? Because that was one, one of the other questions I wanted to ask is that there seems to be this exponential interest now in people wanting to explore their own ability to channel. Oh, I'm of two minds about it, truthfully. I in in 12 step land you know there's this little piece of literature and somewhere in there it says going it alone in spiritual matters can be dangerous and i actually think there's a little bit of truth to that not that there's anything to be frightened of but i think discernment is very important mm -hmm. and prudence and i often say just because somebody wants to talk to you that doesn't have a body means you need to listen to them you know my grandma on the other side was married four or five times she's not who i would go to on relationship advice mm -hmm more than likely, although she might be very happy to tell me, and she might be helpful, I don't know. The guides stress moving into what they call true knowing and divine mind. And those are two other ideas, true knowing, which is the God within or the aspect of you that knows. They say every time you've ever known anything truly known, you've never been afraid because true knowing is the God within. And there's no fear in that. And thinking is a different thing. So the guides encourage people to move towards clear cognizance. And the good news about that is you're not looking outside yourself. You know, I think it's actually of the Claire's, the one that I'm the, the most valuable. And some of the wisest people I know are in their knowing. They don't think of themselves as psychic at all. They just mm -hmm. know. And I think that's great. And I think um, the thing about channeling that I feel strongly about is why? Why do you want to do it? You know, why? Um, right. That's it. Because it, the guides I work with are teachers and it's not, I, I'm helped by this. I sometimes think that what's happened when I was in my early thirties and I was working with his teachers, she said, here's a prayer. It works. Be very careful what you ask for. And I write it down carefully. And I wrote it down. And at that point I was, uh, I was actually very devout in my way. I had this new experience of source. I'd been given enough proof to know that it was real. And I just wanted to go all the way. And I think that's kind of what I wrote on the piece of paper. Like, I want to go all the way with this. And I think because it changed everything, you know, and I'm not walking around holier than anybody at all. But sometimes I think that the books that came through, that they brought through are a way for people to do that if they want. They call, they call me a doorway before. I'm a doorway, mm -hmm. you know. And then they finally said, and I get to walk through it too, just like everybody else. They didn't say, they said that after about six books. I was like, oh, thank God. 
<laughs> I get to do it too. So I don't know. Um, I don't even know if I recall the question. It, 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 I don't know. Well, in terms of other people feeling yeah, this need wanting to, to channel, I yeah. think people, I think you have to have a system that is built for it. In some ways, I'm never going to play pro basketball. I'm not tall enough. You know, I'm probably never going to run, you know, a marathon. But I think I can run and I can play the game. And I think people have different levels of capacity that can be developed. But I do think that there's a skill set available to it. And I do caution people about two things. People get information. Some people are getting these things they are just horrific. And I, I think a high guide will not teach fear. Right. And you don't listen to that. And also will not appeal to the ego. And so when somebody says, well, my guides say that as soon as so-and-so dies, I'm going to be the channel for so-and-so. And I go, oh, brother, mm, that's yeah. a lot of wishful thinking and a lot of ego. And I don't know that it works that way. Right. But right. can we have access? I think we do have guides that seek to work with us. I'm not the guy that hooks people up. But they bring people to what they call the upper room, which is a level of vibration where you can access much more mm -hmm, out mm -hmm. of their world. I want to talk about the upper room before we close out. And I just want to make a comment about this idea of channeling. We use it with an assumption <clears throat> that it it is uh, one thing. It is our essentially acting as a transmitter, a receiver, bringing through the consciousness of another, mm -hmm. typically uh, uh, disincarnate. However, mm -hmm. uh, as a fellow writer, a fellow author, as a creator, I look at it more in a broader sense. There are different iterations of channeling. Mm -hmm. Art is a form of channeling. Teaching mm -hmm. of any kind is a form of channeling. Mm -hmm. Any kind of an art form. Um, I I have to say, I've done it on occasion. I did not mm -hmm. provoke it. It just came mm -hmm. through. Uh, it's come through in painting for me. It's come through in the process of writing. When the muses were speaking loud and clear, there were some things that I knew were not coming from my uh, mm -hmm. my, uh, my my own conscious awareness. So when people say, I want to be a channel, I, I would dare say at some level, you have done that deed already. I agree with you. I, I tend, the only change that I make on that is hmm. when you have inspired art, and I think all great art is inspired and great literature and great music, I think you're being worked with and you are channeling it. You still have the ability to go back and craft and edit and things like that. And when I channel, I make the distinction that I'm not doing that. You know, that's that's for me. But I do completely agree that we all have access to inspiration. And sometimes it comes through highly unfiltered and creates remarkable, remarkable things in the world. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Well, good. That's that's fantastic. There's so many beautiful things happening right now. And, and I'm really, I'm applauding humanity, those that are feeling the calling or the need to step up their game, level up as the young and say uh, about getting involved in some capacity in these sorts of things. So whatever it culminates in for you, journeyers, uh, uh, it's a good thing that it, again, as long as it's um, without ego, as you say, and we're human, so we're going to have a little mm -hmm. ego. I, yeah. I, you know, that's part of the human experience, but um, a lot of people I'm talking to, Paul, are just feeling this desire to take take it to the next level and become more entrenched in this metaphysical space. So, I think it's about allowance. Allow, allow, allow. Give spirit permission. You know, right. nothing really good is going to happen without consent. They do not override free will. You know, but Love if it. you ask to be worked with, and I did, you know, you probably will be attended to at that level, and then developed. And developed. God bless the guides. By the way. God bless them for all that they've done. A couple more things and we're going to close out. By the way, journeyers, we are going to the Patreon after show. And speaking of the guides, no promises. I talked to Paul. I tried to nudge him offline a little bit to see if, if the situation warrants, might they have a message directly for us. But we are going to go uh, over to the after show and talk a little bit about some of the some of the kind of wonky energies that are going on right now. See if they have anything to say about how we might navigate the, that. So stand by for that. But Speaking of the upper room, you brought up the upper room. And speaking of Patreon, our Patreon members uh, love to ask our guests questions, and this is no exception. So I have a question for you, Mr. Paul, from Suzanne. And it's kind of a, she has a couple, but I think I'm just going to be able to fit one in. She says, question, 
are the star beings able to occupy the upper room or are they lower frequency expressions of creator, the star beings? Well, the guides I work with don't talk about star beings. It's actually a phrase that they've never invoked. So I don't know what they would have to say. Everybody is mad. Everybody, everybody, is, mad. everybody is mad at the level of vibration, the kind that they can align to in the upper room. And the upper room is, level, is a level of consciousness that is not only welcoming, but knows the inherent divine, but knows the inherent divine and all who enter and all who enter. It is not a sacred place. It is not a sacred place as much, as much as a level of consciousness that is aligned to, that is aligned to where all things are known as sacred, where all things are known as sacred. It really depends. It really depends on the level of tone, on the level of tone or vibrational agreement or vibrational agreement that a being has come to, that a being has come to regardless of origin, regardless of origin. Thank you for that. That was the guys. That wasn't me. I know that. <laughs> we, we've got the pattern now. Thank you for that. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, and thank you, Suzanne, for the question. When she when she referred to star beings, I, I often, um, I, 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 well, first of all, my audience knows I have a thing with labels. Mm -hmm. I, I rather yeah. loathe them. And I think I don't, they can I like, be I don't like them either, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and that's fine because we, we hear this term a lot. So I, I wasn't quite sure, Suzanne, how uh, you were, um, when you said star beings, what, what you meant by that. But I think the way the guides answered the question makes a lot of sense. This is a space that we all are at some point tethered to, or in some manner tethered to. Would you call the upper room, could you equate that to what a uh, French philosopher, Henri Corbin, called the imaginal realm. I don't know what that means. Um, I've never heard that term again either, no. but I'm not terribly well read. So you have to forgive me. Okay. Um, they talk about it as Christ consciousness. That's the level of vibration. They say the upper room is the highest you can hold while maintaining a form. But they also talk about the upper room as a level of entry. And this is the easiest way, I think, to understand it. They say that the common field or the reality that we know ourselves in is, is, is operating as an octave of, of tone, high and low in a scale. And they say the upper room is already present and it's the octave above the common field that we've known, you know, and the aspect of us that already resides there is what they call the monad or the Christ or the divine spark or the divine self. That part of you or me and everybody is already present there. Mm -hmm. And their work is actually supporting our alignment through the completeness of our being to that level of vibration and tone. So I like to think of it as the octave up. And they say that in some of their work, they often describe it as transposition. They're transposing the music that we are to play in what they call the higher octave. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, we, we tend to want to uh, connect it to something that we are more familiar with, the terminology yeah. that we're more familiar with. I'm, I'm no exception. So I tend, I, I'm thinking of what has been called the, the morphic field or morphic resonance, the field, the mm -hmm. Akashic, perhaps mm -hmm. they're all interchangeable. It is a, 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 a non-physical space that we are somehow yeah. connected to mm -hmm. and can access under certain conditions. I'd like to explore that more, but thank you. Sure. Let's talk about your number 10 is the book of innocence. The one that's coming out number now. 10. Later and this month, froze right? Again. Okay. You just froze again. So I missed half the question. I'm okay. sorry. Maybe on my end. Okay. Sorry about that. The book of innocence coming out soon. Let's talk about that for a little bit. Then I have something I want to read from it. Oh dear. Well, it's the 11th book. Um, and it's the second book in a trilogy they call it the manifestation trilogy where they're really speaking to the manifestation of the divine as an in form come as who you are and who we've always been and it's about the reclamation of the aspect of self that they say is in innocence which is not in fear unsullied they can call it they call it the monad sometimes they call it the christ within it's not a religious teaching their definition of christ is the aspect of the creator that can be realized in form that's how they teach it um mm -hmm. it's the, the the aspect of of the divine that can come in individuation and then be realized in fullness so it's about that part of us coming into reclamation. It's also about what they call the reclamation of memory. And they say, because we've been moored in a field that is operating in a false belief in separation, all memory is accrued through a lens of separation, which they say is untrue. 
So everything that we've ever experienced in form here has been experienced in a world where fear has been present and in some ways predominant as an energy. And they say in the upper room, fear doesn't express because it can't go there. It doesn't align at that level. Mm -hmm. So they're reclaiming us or supporting us in reclamation of memory or ideas of who we are and who we've been or what things were or meant or were called through a common vocabulary so that they can be known anew. You know, they claim everything anew. The book that they just completed, they're calling A World Made New, which is about how the world is, is, is in response to this level of coherence of the inherent divine and how the world is altered through conscious interaction. Why the book? Of, why innocence? Why was that word? I don't know. Chosen? You know, innocence. I, you know, it's funny. It's not what I thought the book was going to be called. And when I said it, I, I crossed my eyes. Went, oh my god, what's this going to be about? What do you think, though? I, I tried I to know think. What about, I, like, think. I know what I think now. Now that I've been through it, they talk in this book about the idea of sin that they say has been screwing with us for a very long time. And all they say that sin is, is the denial of the divine. It's a misfire, you know, it's, that's really all it is. And the aspect that we're reclaiming is the aspect that exists in innocence and on innocence in the most profound, wondrous way. You know, lately they're talking about how you reach a level of alignment where the world unfolds before you moment by moment. It's like this idea of everything being unveiled again and again and again as it's its true nature it's the true presence is revealing itself in your interaction but it's the realization of this aspect of you that is in wonder that allows this and you know i'm an old jaded new yorker and <laughs> you know, a curmudgeon much of the time i'm afraid so oh well you say the word wonder the the, the, wonder. the, the emotion of wonder and that begets innocence and innocence yeah. they, they reciprocate you, know, you think of a child and yeah. yeah. So, well, I'm really looking forward to, actually, I do have an advanced copy. I'm going to peruse that, uh, not peruse, I'm going to read it cover to cover, I think. Uh, but it's coming out, I think it's the end of this month. Yes. The, I think it's the 18th. So okay. It's well, like next about week. About a week. About okay. a week or so. That's yeah, great. Oh my God. Paul, anything else you'd like to share with us before we head next door to the upper room? Oh. We're going to go to the upper room. My Patreon is the upper room. <laughs> Tell no. us where we can find you. I know where you are online, yeah. but you tell everybody where you live. My website is, is paulselig.com. It has information on the books. It ha I do a lot of live stream events, and I'm doing live events now. I'm traveling again, so there's a number okay. of ways to work with the guys in person, which is great for me because I like to meet people. And yes. um, But it's all there. I hope I get to meet you soon. I would like that too. That would be great. Oh, beautiful. Well, listen, guys, this has been a pleasure. And, and we're starting at a brand new season, brand new guest. And I hope it's not going to be the last time we get a visit from Mr. Selig. So uh, come on, join us over on uh, the Patreon upper room. I say that kind of in jest, but you know, <laughs> it'll be a fun conversation. Paul, you are a dear and a pleasure. And uh, don't hang out. We're going to go next door. But I just want to say thank you on behalf of all of us here at Higher Journeys for lending us a, a little bit of your wisdom. A lot of it, actually. We appreciate you. Thank you. All right, Journeyers. We'll talk to you real soon. Hope to see you next door. Take good care. Bye. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to watch what's next, plus more to explore. And don't forget to subscribe to Higher Journeys.